All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is um, our first lecture in the series on German, European, and global history. My name is Stefan Hoffmann. I teach uh, in the history department. Uh, and before I introduce um, our speaker today, um, let me uh, thank uh, the co organizers and co sponsors, sponsors of this event um, the Pacific Office of the German Historical Institute, in particular. Heike Friedman and uh, Ray Savor, um, as well as the Center for German and European Studies and its executive director, Akasel Newsom, who can't be here today. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Norma Feldman for her generous support of the lecture series over many years now. Um, and I wanted to mention that we have a few more events lined up. So we have um, Lauren Stokes uh, from Northwestern University coming in, um, I think, the week after Thanksgiving. Um, and we have in early February Dagmar Herzog um, coming uh, for a lecture. We are also very fortunate to have Sebastian Konrad um, here. Um, Sebastian is going to give the Gerda Henkel lecture uh, next Tuesday, same time, same place. I think uh, the title of the lecture is Nefertiti's 20th Century Career, A Global History. Um, and I will introduce um, Sebastian Conrad uh, in more detail next Tuesday. Um, he has the chair in modern global, modern history, global history at the Free University of Berlin. Um, and as many of you here in the room and on Zoom know, one of the leading um, historians, uh, European, Japanese history, but also global history. Um, so finally, let me introduce, uh, most importantly, our guest speaker today. Um, I don't know how the last two years have been for you. Uh, Glenn Penny apparently had a phenomenal time. Um, he, um, after what was already a very distinguished career as a professor at the University of Kansas in Iowa, Glenn was appointed uh, this summer to be the Henry uh, Bruman Chair in German History um, at UCLA. Um, so congratulations uh, again. Uh, he also won the Guggenheim Fellowship um, last year, and he published his most recent monograph, uh, his fourth uh, not counting um, his edited volumes. Um, so the most recent monograph appeared with Cambridge. Uh, it's called uh, German History Unbound, 1750s to the Present. And it offers readers a polycentric German history uh, that actually takes its starting point from an essay by Jim Sheehan, um, who is on Zoom, I think. Um, so um, it's very nice to um, have um, Jim also here um, virtually. Um, Glenn's work more generally explores the relationships between Europeans and non-Europeans from the 18th century to the present. He's particularly interested in Germans' broad engagement with the wider world. First book was Object of Culture, Ethnology and Ethnographic Museums in Imperial Germany, first comparative study of German ethnographic museums. Um, he published a second book, Kindred by Choice, Verwandte Germans and American Indians since 1800, which explores the striking sense of affinity for the love affair, um, which would have been also a great title for the book, uh, the, the German love affair with the American Indians. Um, and he um, was a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg um, and completed there his third book, which is called um, In Humboldt's Shadow, A Tragic History of German Ethnology and uh, came out in German, uh, but also uh, in English, and is his um, contribution to the ongoing debate um, in German about, uh, in Germany, uh, about um, the colonial objects that are now at display at the Humboldt Forum. Um, so we are, you know, very happy to have you here, Glenn, and are looking forward to your uh, talk, which is entitled Globalizing Landesgeschichte, Reflections on Narrating German Histories in the Modern Era. Well, uh, thank you very much. I mean, first of all, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction, Stefan. I appreciate it. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, thanks for looping Sebastian in and, and, and forcing him to talk about what I'm going to talk about. 
Um, and thanks to all of you for coming out. I mean, in the Zoom era, to have such a big public in person is really a delight. Uh, I, I'm particularly pleased to be in California, in the Bay Area, and uh, eager to have a conversation with you about about globalizing London this week. Um, this is, I have to make sure I don't stay too far from the camera, I'm sorry. I'm going to be fixated on that little thing more than I should be. Um, you know, I came to the notion of globalizing London's Geschichte pretty inadvertently. Um, I've often said that my primary research method or strategy is simply to stumble into problems that perplex me or irritate me or make me angry and uh, then just try to figure them out. And in that sense, my complete incompetence were things like the history of Bayern, Baden-Württemberg, Vorarlberg, where's that? Um, Tyrol, Switzerland, well, actually became a, a virtue of sorts because essentially I happened upon people from these places during the work that I was doing on Germans in Latin America and they made me want to know more about the region, which I started to loosely label the southern German borderlands. It's a pretty highly problematic descriptor, but it works for the moment. And as I started to dig into this territory and think about it, I started rethinking German history in, in ways that I'm finding pretty productive. So part of this rethinking this is where I actually wrote the tech. Help? <laughs> Perfect. So I'll just ask you to change the slides. OK, my arrow didn't work. Um, part of this rethinking was already in motion when I, I wrote this this book, which just came out this summer, um, which essentially grew out of, a com uh, I guess, a culmination of problems that I've been wrestling with over the last couple of decades. The biggest of which was just trying to figure out, how do you narrate a polycentric German history that places communities of self-proclaimed Germans and their interconnections at its center rather than the history of a nation state or really any state for that matter? Um, now, as I did that, I spent a lot of time thinking about Germans pretty much all over the world. And as you can tell from the cover, I spent a good deal of that time focused on Latin America. And in part, that's because those migrants had seen much less scholarly attention than their counterparts in places like Eastern and Central Europe or Russia or even North America. But they appear to me to be just as important, if not more important, to what I was starting to think of as a globalized German history that was punctuated less by the radical ruptures of major geopolitical events or the lives and fates of regimes dominating the German nation state than the many consistent networks and relationships that persisted right through those transformations. So to be honest, I also simply just wanted to know why there were so many German communities in Latin America, um, particularly across the Southern Cone, and why it was that I, who was a German historian, supposedly didn't know anything about them. And I also wondered what their histories might tell me about the last couple centuries of both European and German history that the secondary literature hadn't. Um, and it turns out that the many German communities that took shape across Latin America after the 1880s had a lot to teach me, particularly when I thought about things like soft forms of power that grew along with the emergence of global gamanophone networks of transportation and travel and trade in the modern era. I also learned a great deal about um, Germans' interactions with non-Europeans, a topic that's interested me pretty much since I entered the profession, as you can tell by the list of books. Um, now, I could talk to you about this book at pretty annoying length um, and the arguments, but I kind of moved past them, and so I'm not going to do that. What I'd like to do with the rest of my time is is basically just focus on three things. Um, the often overlooked historiographical importance of the southern German borderlands, um, how globalizing Landesgeschichte of the regions might actually draw that into relief, and somewhat surprisingly, maybe for you, how the work of generations of Volkskundler, or people who we now call working in the Pirsch's cultural Wissenschaft, and focused on these regions might actually help us quite a lot in, in these endeavors. Now, to get to those points, I want to take you through a little bit of my own intellectual journey, um, which has been filled with a, a number of you know, what I would call poignant missteps um, and miscalculations that, again, have actually proven to be incredibly fruitful. And so the place I'm going to begin is actually with Guatemala. Nice. Um, so now it's going to get a little weird, but I promise to bring you back to southern Germany um, eventually. <laughs> 
Uh, when I think about Germans in Guatemala, I think of highly inclusive, transcultural communities that are locally grounded, but globally oriented. And these German communities were well established in Guatemala by the turn of the 20th century. And although there were never more than a few thousand German speakers in Guatemala at any moment between the 1880s and the 1940s, those communities were and remain the largest concentration of German speakers in Central America. And throughout those decades, they generated a large percentage of Guatemala's GDP. Really significant. Um, next slide. Moreover, while most of them were well integrated into German society, they clearly lived transcultural, transatlantic lives. Many leading trading families worked simultaneously in Bremen and or Hamburg while living in the capital city of Guatemala and or one of their many plantations. And most of them made sure that their children were Guatemalan as well as German citizens. Um, next slide. Now on the one hand, that gave these Germans a lot of advantages. Most importantly, they could draw on the many forms of cultural, economic, social capital tied to being German in Guatemala. For example, and this is actually quite important, until the 1930s, the vast majority of the coffee they produce is traded almost exclusively on the Hamburg Coffee Exchange and consumed in Europe. But their insider-outsider status also made these German Guatemalans incredibly vulnerable because even though they were the people who most linked other Guatemalans into international trade networks and connected Central America to Central European industry and markets, the shifting Guatemalan regimes always had the monopoly on violence within their national borders. And that, in fact, is one of the things that made the German connection so appealing to this and other Latin American regimes, because these Germans offered a less threatening alternative to the British, the French, and later the United States, all of whom saw economic and political hegemony along with trade relations. Uh, so it's actually Imperial Germany's political and military weakness at the turn of the century that's part of these Germans' secret to success, to economic success. Moreover, while Imperial Germany does set up a favored nation trading agreement with Guatemala in the 1880s, that's only after Germans living there had done all the hard work of building relations. This is actually incredibly consistent, not just in Guatemala. Um, and this is particularly important to bear in mind. In Latin America, the German nation state follows the actions of German speakers living abroad. It doesn't take the lead in building relationships. Uh, next slide. It also couldn't control them. It couldn't defend these Germans. And thus, in both world wars, as the, German, as the Guatemalan state broke relationships with the German nation state, Germans living in Guatemala suffered property seizures. And in World War II, there were widespread confiscations as well as internments of thousands. And in both cases, the Guatemalan state's political elites enriched themselves on German properties during the crises. And in neither case could the German nation state help. And in both cases, the rebuilding had to take place by those networks of Germans in Central America because neither the emerging Weimar Republic or later the young West Germany proved to be of much value, basically no value at all. Now, none of this sounds much like the kinds of inform informal imperialism or neo-colonial situations that dominate a lot of the post-colonial literature on Latin America's relations with foreign actors, or even most of the literature on Germans in the world, which I think tends to privilege analyses of colonial connections and particularly forms of exploitation. Um, except that one could argue, should notice, uh, in fact, that Germans who came to dominate a great deal of coffee production and other businesses in Guatemala from the 1880s to the 1930s clearly benefited from the Guatemalan state's efforts at internal colonialism because the labor on German plantations, like all the plantations in Guatemala, was largely Mayan labor that was forced into debt peonage by the Guatemalan state statutes. So Germans, like everyone else, participated in the system. So they're, of course, complicit. Now, this is where it gets most interesting and where my own incompetence turns into a kind of virtue that takes me eventually to Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria. Because what we find among the coffee capitalists in Guatemala and this is something the British, the French, and the US observers consistently noted and lamented from the 1880s through the 1930s, is that Germans in Guatemala, like in most of Latin America, were incredibly good at integrating into local cultures, learning local languages, finding ways to do business that benefited their partners as well as themselves. And in the case of many German plantation owners, 
but by no means all, they quickly found ways to integrate into local kinship networks, learn local languages, not just Spanish, and quickly made themselves, I guess you could say, the lesser evil among the many property owners. Now, there's no question that this paid large dividends economically, but there's also very little question that it was all about the money. And in general, Germans in Guatemala showed a great deal more interest in these local cultures and peoples than did their British or US counterparts, not to mention the Ladinos, or the native-born Spanish-speaking elites who had basically no interest in speaking Mayan languages or learning about the cultures of what they considered their underclasses, just the opposite. Now, I was pretty intrigued when I learned about this characteristic, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. Why are they so successful? Why do they do this? Everybody who worked on coffee capitalism in Central America knew that Germans in Guatemala were simply better capitalists than the Americans, the Europeans, or their Latino counterparts. But nobody could tell me why. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they all agreed that this was largely due to the fact that many of these Germans were quick to learn the languages, to integrate into the cultures of the plantation workers. Again, next slide. They couldn't explain to me why they were doing this. Um, in fact, most of the scholars who put their post-colonial theories first, or who reached back to old models of dependency theory, which is still fairly prolific, thought that this was simply base opportunism, a kind of cynical business model that allowed Germans to better control labor forces and even lure laborers away from other owners' plantations. And that was, in fact, one function of their efforts. But it didn't take me very long to realize that that wasn't the only intention. Next slide. So the thing is, people like Erwin Paul Dieseldorf, who was one of the leading coffee capitalists of the age, never trained at a university, comes from a humble trading family, not only learned Maya languages, there are many Maya languages, by the way, um, but also integrated himself into kinship networks while he built a vertically integrated coffee empire. Now, at the same time, he dives into the history of the region the natural history, the ethnology, the archaeology. He becomes a central interlocutor with a whole series of American and European scholars interested in Central American and particularly Mayan cultures and history and archaeology. In fact, he becomes a reigning expert by the interwar period, publishing essays on artifacts, languages, natural history, and scholarly journals, participating in international scholarly meetings, creating sizable archaeological collections that he then donates to museums in Europe, in Guatemala, even the United States. And there's absolutely no profit in that. He did, of course, understand the utility, the cultural capital. It's inherent in what he was doing and his knowledge gathering. And while I was reading the papers of David Zappa, the cousin of Richard Zappa, another equally important coffee capitalist in Guatemala, I was stunned to learn that David Zappa, who travels alone from Germany to New York and then from New Orleans to Guatemala when he's 15 years old, learns to speak Kechi from Dieseldorf after they meet by accident on the ship that takes the young Zappa across the Caribbean. It's a chance encounter, but once Dieseldorf learns who David Zappa was, and once he understands which plantation he was going to, he made a point of teaching him the Maya language he would need on that particular plantation so that the young Zappa would be ahead of the game when he arrived. Now, maybe it's because I had a teenage son at the time, but I found it particularly astounding that a 15-year-old David Zappa would learn this language on the boat. And then I reflected and realized that, you know, this 15-year-old could already speak German, English, French, Italian, as well as the dialect around the southern Italian city of Bari on the Adriatic, where he had attended a German school supported by its German colony because his father worked there as a merchant. As a result, David Zappa quickly learned his first Maya language before he even learned Spanish because as Dieseldorf taught him, it would be much more important for his work, just as the local Italian dialect around Bari had been more important for his father's work, much more important than the written Italian based on the Tuscan um, dialect, which is the standard literary dialect of Italy. Next slide. Thank you. Now, this particular talent, it seemed to me, was pretty typical of trade families from the Hansa states. In fact, it also seemed to me that it was the history of the Hansa city states, much more than German nation state, that best explained a great deal of these German successes in Guatemala and other places, 
as people like the Dieseldorfs and the Soppers continue to live and work in places where others held a monopoly on political power and violence, while they simultaneously tied themselves to local cultures, linguistic networks, and worked within transnational and transcultural gamophone networks of travel, transportation, and trade. After all, Hansa trading families have been doing this for centuries. In fact, I was really pleased with myself when I made this argument in a 2017 essay in Geschichte and Gesellschaft about migrants and knowledge production. And it was only actually a few years ago that it dawned on me that it was actually a pretty significant problem in my thinking. Because the Zappers were not from Bremen or Hamburg or any other northern trade cities. They were from Stuttgart. And in fact, as a good number of people who worked on the plantations were from the region as well, which is why one could still encounter mixed race children of those people speaking Schwedish on the plantations right through the Second World War and into the post-war period. Isn't that interesting? Mayan workers speaking Schwedish in the hills of Guatemala in the 1960s. <laughs> now, it's not that I didn't know about the global trade networks that cut across southern Germany or the great amount of outmigration from Baden and Württemberg to places as diverse as the Caucasus, Minnesota, Argentina, Venezuela, Chile. In fact, one of the interesting things I discovered while working through the files of the Deutsches Auslandsinstitut and the Bundesarchiv in Lichtenfeld in Berlin is that while the Deutsches Auslandsinstitut compiled lists of leading Germans, their businesses, opportunities um, for German migrants all over the world, and particularly in Latin America during the interwar period, where the vast majority go, they also had a second list of Schwaben. This stunned me. The, Deutsches, the Deutsche Auslandsinstitut was not only one of the largest associations for aiding immigrants during the Weimar Republic who wanted to go abroad, one of the many meant to promote this, both the safe migration of Germans abroad and their continued connections to the homeland, they also simultaneously actively promoted global Schwaben networks and connections to that homework, homeland as well. Of course, this shouldn't surprise us after all because the Deutsches Auslands Institute is located in Stuttgart. So once I realized my mistake, once I understood that I'd allowed really the hegemonic tale of Hamburg's dominance of a germanophone global trade in the modern era to color my analyses of Germans in Guatemala, as well as other parts of Latin America, I started to pay more attention to the eclectic mixes of Germans in Latin American locations to think about what allowed them to succeed in such a wide variety of places. And I started to wonder more concretely about the integrative character of these German communities abroad, both the ways in which they often brought together wide varieties of German speakers into so-called German communities, associations, businesses, churches, schools, and other organizations that included Germans from all over Central Europe, as well as Russia and North America, and how and why they often did so well economically and professionally within a great variety of host communities. And here again, I wondered about fluidity, mobility, transcultural, multilingual communities. And after a while, I realized that all of those things would be pretty familiar to people from the southern German borderlands during the 19th and 20th centuries, perhaps even more so than from among Germans from the north and places like Prussia. And that was true even if the southern borderlands and, well, get very little attention in the broader narratives of German history. And so now I'm getting to the point. As my time um, working in Tübingen over the last few years has taught me, people from Württemberg had long been steeped in a great deal of polycentrism. Cultural diversity, multiplicities of dialects, landscapes, and like much of what I keep calling um, the Southern German borderlands, for the lack of a better term, they've been quite familiar with labor migrations and other forms of mobility for a very long time. Centuries, really. And in that sense, while I was analyzed, what I was analyzing in Latin America would, have not, would not have been unfamiliar to people from the region running roughly from Salzburg through Innsbruck and Bregenz to Freiburg and Basel. It was only, like so many other things at the end of the 19th century, a question of upscaling. Greater distances, larger numbers of people, more mixing. But in that sense, it's not unlike the shift by southern German trading houses around Augsburg from the Mediterranean to global trade in the preceding century was also which was also pretty seamless. So in a lot of ways, I have to credit COVID-19 
um, for helping me figure this out because a few years ago when I received the Guggenheim that Stefan mentioned, um, it was to complete a project I'd been calling Being German in Guatemala. Uh, and that was going to require about another six months of archival research in Guatemala City, which I hope to complete in 2020. And as I suspect you know, um, never got to go back to, or not yet. And then my effort to shift my focus to completing some work that I'd begun in Chile in, in 2019 was completely stymied by the same problem because although Chile managed to do extremely well during the first wave of COVID, um, many of the members of the middle classes were so happy with that, they decided to go to Brazil on vacation in the summer of 2020, which led to them coming back and completely shutting down the country with a second wave of infection soon afterwards. So I couldn't go there either. As luck would have it, however, I, I had a teaching position in Tübingen, so I made lemons out of my lemonade, so to speak. Went to southern Germany, and initially my goal was, well, pretty simple. I thought, if I wanted to better understand these German speakers in places like Argentina and Chile, where there's such eclectic mixes of Germans and Swiss are creating colonies and communities and thriving, well, maybe I just need to learn more about the communities they produce them in Europe. And that proved to be true. But at the same time, I actually learned a great deal about the region that made me want to study it more closely for its own sake, which is what I'm doing now. Thinking about the global implications of the Landesgeschichte and allowing that to help me rethink our narratives of German history and Germans in Latin America and other parts of the world. So first of all, and this seems pretty obvious to me now, but after I'd spent a little time in Tübingen, where I go and teach at the Ludwig Olympus Institute for Empirische Kulturwissenschaft, I started to wonder why the southern German border rece has received so little attention in the more general narratives of German history. It's a kind of a funny question, actually. I mean, historians have filled rooms with books on the eastern German border, where it was, where it should have been, how it moved, how its role in people's lives have shifted and changed across our clearly periodized local histories. The eastern border seems, at least from the view of states and historians who study and promote them, to be a perennial problem one that demands solutions, which led, as you know, to a great deal of violence. And I'm not going to dispute its importance, um, but I do wonder if the eastern border is any more important than the southern German border, which, if we're seeing like a state, doesn't appear to be much of a problem at all. I mean, OK, Bavarian armies invaded the Tyrol during the French Revolutionary Wars. Next slide. We know that. There's a gigantic panorama exhibit in Innsbruck dedicated to this outrage. You can go see it. Um, for Alberg, citizens tried to leave Austria uh, and become part of Switzerland after World War I. We know that, too. Um, during the National Socialist period, the Nazis pushed their administrative um, boundaries across the border. But it always seemed, more or less, to snap back into place with little bloodshed and not much consternation on the part of the states involved. So I wonder. Are we missing some critical lessons by ignoring that process or the fact that it actually is a relatively peaceful one? Are peaceful historical processes not instructive? I kind of think they should be. And what about the people who lived in this borderland region? What can they teach us? In what ways, for example, did their mental maps compare to the political maps we use in our textbooks? And if you read my most recent book, I've got some peeves about that. Um, I'm afraid that German history, uh, particularly as it's narrated in English language texts, uh, had very little to say about, about this. Um, next slide. Uh, a lot of these maps, uh, well, a lot of the political maps we use in our books are basically exercises in all kinds of reification. In many ways, our history books, in fact, uh, the lack of violence seems almost synonymous with a lack of importance. But again, I'd like to say, just that the opposite is true. And, and in some ways, I believe this neglected region can tell us a lot more about the contours of a globalized German history than those regions that were animated for so long by a series of uh, often violent and quite titillating ruptures. To see that importance, however, I'm afraid we have to see less like a state and perhaps more like a region. Next slide. But not a Celia Applegate region. I, I love Celia, but I'm thinking more of something like the Bodensee. Um, which is a kind of region which is not a regional state, yet it's clearly a place of belonging, one bordered by political borders that play limited roles in people's mental maps, while the Bodensee itself was long seen as a point of orientation, a center, or perhaps a set of many centers for people living all around it and oftentimes pretty far from its shores. Or, next slide, 
What about the Alps, which cut across many political borders as well, but are filled with people, mountain people, who share affinities. Some of these people are not just Swiss German, they're also Bergler, an idea that crosses a lot of political borders, linguistic borders, mountain ranges, but doesn't include those people who live in the valleys in between. The Alps are also filled with mountain resorts, ski areas, spas, places that a number of scholars have shown recently were decidedly cosmopolitan, even if their locations were incredibly provincial, even purposefully so. That means that the provincial, some even said primitive regions of the Alps were long animated by networks of cosmopolitan, transnational, quintessentially modern interconnections, while the nearby towns and cities were not, which tells us what. Um, next slide. I think it's also worth pointing out that the wild animals that move through these regions, they don't really seem to notice the borders, which is one of the controversies at the center of the reintroduction of wolves in the Alps today. Um, there's actually been some fantastic work on this, and many of the people who tended domesticated herds, flocks nearby, they moved regularly across these borders for generations over centuries in pretty instructive ways. That's just how life worked. That's what was necessary to regulate the lives of the cows the production of the hay, the production of the milk, and none of the big geopolitical shifts that punctuate our typical national narratives of Central European history managed to upset much of that at all. So what does that tell us about our reliance on those narratives as we both structure our analyses at home and abroad and live our lives in, well, modern Europe? Now, we can also choose to be splitters rather than lumpers and still make the same point. After all, why is for Alberg and Bregenz in particular so affluent today? In many ways, um, next slide, it has a great deal to do with the history of labor mobility, uh, which has not only included many peddlers from the now um, for a great deal of time, but also the famous Schwabenkinder who streamed north across the border during the last decades of the 19th century to seek employment during times of need, but also highly skilled weavers who were able to travel all over Europe and the Americas by the end of the century working for the highest bidders. They could do that because of their skills developed and honed largely in textile industries founded by Swiss industrialists who saw advantages in setting up business just down the shore, so to speak, because down the shore was also across the border, which gave them untaxed access to Austrian-Hungarian empire, as well as its cheap labor, and those interconnections persisted for, well, more than a century before, during, and after the fall of that empire. Now, I could continue down the list of things that crossed the borders and tied more places and peoples together, like the ubiquitous tourism that grows with the mountaineering as a leisure activity and tied the region to a great many major cities, including most major cities in northern Germany. The ski industry, as you probably know, um, only expanded that during the post-war era. Andrew Denning wrote a great book about it. Uh, we could also talk about the analysis story. Next slide. Lucy Varga's fantastic 1936 ethnography of one valley, she actually wrote about more than one, and Fualberg, which demonstrated that while Vienna remained the capital of Austria at the time, its auspicious place on political maps did not have its counterpart in her subjects' mental maps. Vienna was no center for them. And when they thought of cities, it was first Bregenz, Innsbruck, maybe Munich, maybe Zurich, where most of her subjects had been long before it would have been Volta Wien in the interwar period, which very few bothered to think about, much less to visit. There was, in fact, a great deal of transnational life happening in the region, and a great many transcultural places here as well. To see those, however, it helps to look on these borders through the eyes of ethnologists rather than historians of Germany, uh, myself included. Volkskundler in particular have been casting their focus on the border regions for generations, paying a great deal of attention to a multitude of borders, not just national ones, and to a whole range of languages many of us would call dialects. So too have the people engaged in what's sometimes dismissed as Landeskunde, who've been aware of the diversity of their regions as well, but tend to be engaged in conversations with themselves. And I think it's part of the cunning teleology of the nation state that causes those of us who claim to be historians of Germany to frequently just dismiss Landeskunde in the first place as something with only local importance, perhaps useful to cite, but seldom to engage. As for the Volkskundler, well, recast as European ethnology or Kulturwissenschaft, 
Many historians are interested in Alltagsgeschichte began working with them in the 90s, particularly in urban settings, sometimes within the context of Werkstattsgeschichte, but dialects, villages, rural communities didn't really interest them that much. Oh, next picture. But for my own work, getting over such disciplinary divisions is part of the practice of rethinking German history, and I find that the work produced in the area of empirical Kulturwissenschaft particularly compelling. To some degree, that's clearly because the field formerly known as Volkskunde was forced generations ago to come to terms with the nation state's influence on it. As scholars like Hermann Baltzinger focused on the lives of people rather than the lives and fates of states. Or as he once wrote, well, kind of riffing on Bertolt Brecht, focusing on Bevölkerung rather than Volk or Volker. It's really an important distinction. Uh, that particularly when combined with his ongoing response to the putatively rooted character of Heimat histories, which everyone liked to talk about in the 90s, that people have legs, not roots. And those are two powerful insights that remind us of the importance mobility has long played in the region, and which he spent his whole career studying. As a result, already in the 50s and the 60s, much of Bautzinger's work around Tübingen focused on questions of migration, transference, the large and small networks crisscrossing the region. He was writing, in fact, about the influx of foreigners, Vetriebne, long before it was cool. He was teaching us about the great variety of dialects in the region, some imported by those new arrivals. And he was tying all of that into notions of belonging a half century before I took part in a great big meeting devoted to just that topic in Tübingen last fall. Now, next picture. It's pretty stunning, in fact, to read his 1971 Volkskunde, von der Altertumsforschung, to culture analyse, which underscores two incredibly important forms of post-war mobility that mattered a great deal. Flows of refugees across the New Bundes Republic and tourism beyond localities, or what he called the delocalization of leisure behavior to the point of almost borderless tourism. Both of these helped to usher in fundamentally new forms of spatial orientation, which gave many traditional cultural markers incredibly new meanings and functions which he traced and analyzed. One of the most important things he wrote about is the constructed character of culture, particularly historical traditions, the transference to these new forms of mobility. And I honestly almost fell out of my chair last summer when I was reading this old book. It's pretty amazing to realize that he wrote about all this a decade before Hobsbawm and Ranger transformed cultural history pretty much globally while introducing their arguments about the inventions of traditions. I mean, clearly, they weren't aware of the fact that Baltzinger and his colleagues in Tübingen had already been thinking and writing about that for decades. But I really don't feel comfortable criticizing them because until last year, neither did I. <laughs> um, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not interested in hagiography. I'm not looking to convince you to join me um, as the new Baltzinger disciples. That's not the point. Um, I think it's also important to understand that Baltzinger, too, was channeling things that predated him. And he seemed to understand that. Uh, for close to a century, in fact, um, and even after the hyper-nationalization of the field by the turn of the, uh, the end of the 19th century, Volkskundler, he wrote in 1979, had been exploring overlapping notions of belonging, thinking about the many borders that persist in our heads. Where, for example, is Oberösterreich? How many people in Baden-Württemberg know when they enter former Hohenzoller lands today? Some do. And for them, it matters. For others, it doesn't, which tells us what exactly. We all move through our own world, mental, and all we have our own mental maps, and we're often unaware of the phantom landscapes animating the lives of the other people around us. There's been some great work by Kathleen Kahnsen on this. Um, he did a lot of work on Germans in the American Midwest, but its application is not limited to that location at all. Um, but let me get back to those older practitioners for just a minute, uh, who included people like Wilhelm Heinrich Riel, and who were also pursuing questions about performing identity, a topic that was long a great interest of mine. Um, more, as Baltinger later realized, they did that precisely at the moment when radical modernization gripped these landscapes during the middle of the 19th century, causing a dramatic uptick in the scale of mobility and industry. So, while historians during that era ignored everyday life, Volkskundler began studying it, collecting material culture from people's homes, from their hometowns, exploring the fluidities 
on the southern German borderlands. And the important point is not to celebrate them, but to recognize that those records are extant. Now, such records are never unbiased, never unfiltered, never complete, but then neither are the ethnologies of non-European cultures that a variety of scholars, including many working with indigenous interlocutors, many of whom are scholars as well, are successfully harnessing to reconstitute histories, revitalize languages and cultures in a great variety of non-European locations today. And I'd like to suggest to you that we can use the records of European ethnologists who move throughout the southern German borderlands in equally successful ways. And we can place them into productive comparative analyses. After all, in many cases, they used the same collectors. So I'd be remiss, next slide, if I didn't point out that after Adrian Jakobsen, um, who I've written a lot about, traveled to the coast of British Columbia to collect what remains one of the most complete assemblies of material culture from that part of the world, for Adolf Bastian's Museum for Volkerkunde in Berlin, Rudolf Fierschel hired him to travel to the Tyrol to generate one of the earliest Volkskunde collections for his museum in Berlin, which he did for precisely the same reasons to capture the vestiges, the records of cultures on the cusp of radical transition using exactly the same methods and encountering in many cases some of the very same challenges he had faced in British Columbia and Alaska. It's stunning actually to compare his records, his diaries, his letters about this. Those records and the work compiled by later ethnologists can, for example, teach us a great many things. Just reading their accounts of singing cultures in alpine villages, for instance, instance, reminded me a lot of the compartmentalized character of Hopi religion, which I spent a lot of time thinking about. Now, not everyone on the three mesas in the Hopi reservation knows it all. That's on purpose. But until this moment, neither I nor anyone else had thought much about comparing these two locations. Why would we? We don't tend to read the old folks' culture. Now, I apologize for returning again to my revelations about Bautzinger, but it's pretty stunning to read his work from the 70s, which underscores the reifications inherent in mapping, the fundamental problems with any systems of typologies, with explanations that Volkskundler's efforts to sort things, like varieties of German houses, only led to the disheartening conclusion that those types of houses were never only created or used by German speakers, nor were they generally exclusive to one clearly inscribed region. Even terms like Schwaben, he warned us, elided differences, obscured things like class, whereas the reanimation of folk art that he witnessed and wrote about in subalpine regions during the post-war period is stunning for a number of reasons. And here again, his observations resonate in instructive ways with those of ethnologists focused on similar problems in other parts of the world. So the thing to understand is that alpine artisans working in the age of high tourism, Bautzner realized, increasingly produced objects like furniture for urban tastes, rather than due to any devotion to traditional craft work or underlying artisanal culture. Well, that response to market mechanisms was commonplace on the Hopi mesas as well, and that's well documented. In fact, that dialogic is something that Sally Price, next picture, wrote about in her blockbuster, 1989, Primitive Art in Civilized Places, but again, only decades after Bautzinger's studies had analyzed similar processes in Europe, which she probably never read. Even the ties Bautzinger wrote about between the post-war Heimat Renaissance in the 1980s and the histories of German-speaking refugees and guest workers in Baden-Württemberg speaks volumes about the global cultural mobilities through and from this region and the many modes of performing German-ness that scholars are only now discovering as they compare current semiotics of beer, festivals, and Trachten in places like Brazil and Bio, or ponder the longer histories of in-migration and integration in a German-speaking Europe while arguing about the implications of the so-called welcoming culture of the Federal Republic today. So again, to my mind, a return to reading the writings of those scholars who, before and after Lucy Varga's stunning work on Vorarlberg, were and have been digging into everyday life in the southern German borderlands means the chance to engage a complex Alltagsgeschichte that most historians of Germany have long overlooked or outright ignored. And again, it's often the quiet instances in this history that are the most compelling, be they the rather peaceful history of the region in the modern era, 
The seldom told success stories of well-integrated guest workers before and during the period, and especially in the second half of the 20th century, the equally overlooked fact that post-war Germany was incredibly diverse and able to integrate a large percentage of outsiders, or the fact that, and this is what just kind of blew my mind, the polycentrism that I like to place at the center of German history always had its counterpart in such a striking number of distinct cultures, dialects, and landscapes, in even small areas, tiny parts of Southern Germany. Um, next slide. If you don't believe me, you can take this trip between Isni and Aldoy and the interior of the Schwarzwald, which Baltinger sketched out in great detail in the 70s, and which I did on a bicycle last summer. <laughs> if you do it, you get a treat. You will encounter incredibly varied polycentric regions and spaces all along the way. Moreover, it's not just Baltinger, and none of this is limited to Tübingen or Baden-Württemberg. I have been stunned by some of the work by Konrad Kuhn, who's an outstanding ethnologist who teaches Volkskunde at Innsbruck on the origins of Swiss masks, for example. I could give you a whole literature. Um, Walter Leingruber uh, in Basel on dialects and code switching in Switzerland. Stunning work. And many histories of mobility and migration that were often overlooked by scholars and politicians for far too long and which he has brought back into political discourse. Uh, also, the work on the Swiss living outside of Switzerland, not to mention the non-Swiss living inside it, building it, creating it, maintaining it. It's fantastic stuff. Here, too, the longer history of those successful labor migrations, white as well as blue collar, the multiple modes of belonging, often lost in political debates, but many scholars today on all sides of the national borders are now drawing them out. And to my mind, that mobility needs to be given more attention and are more general narratives of German histories in Europe and abroad. So last slide. So I'm just going to end by underscoring that one of the most compelling arguments coming out of Switzerland, for example, has been about colonialism without colonies, which is also simply about Swiss people and things all over the world. And the arguments have been animating uh, the, the Swiss Academy for over a decade, but they also have a lot to teach us about how to think of colonial connections in the German-speaking world north of Switzerland. Official colonialism, and particularly violence, gets all the scholarly and political attention, but the Swiss story reminds us that one need not have participated in official colonialism or even visited a colony to have moved in and been part of an imperial world. And in that sense, our obsession with official colonies often reifies the many ways in which German people or people from German-speaking Europe engaged with the non-European world, either during or after that era. And it makes us overlook many of the ways in which German speakers came together and worked together while abroad. It reminds us, for example, of the fact that there were more Germans in Argentina than all the official German colonies combined, and that places like Guatemala far outshine the economic importance of Imperial Germany's official colonies. Now, I could go on with countless examples um, about how to better understand everyday life across southern Germany and how that should inform our general histories of, of Germany and Germans um, in the world, but I think I've given you enough to generate some conversations, and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Should we go? I uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, thanks for for this, you know, for this um, for the invitation to ask the first question. That's how we agreed. Uh, I, I would. I mean, I, I didn't have to talk uh, beforehand, so I have all I have is to go by is what what you have as well. The the only difference is that I traveled far longer than you did to come here, so that's why I, I, I get this uh, honor. Uh, Glenn, it's always it's always a pleasure to to hear you talk, and I, I, you could have just gone on for hours. It, in fact, I, I think if, if there's a topic that's boring, I'll ask you to present it. I'm sure I'll, I'll be fascinated. <laughs> you exude all this enthusiasm, uh, which is just incredible, uh, but also it's, it, and it's, it's really difficult to not get carried away by it. So, so Bausinger, <laughs> uh, uh, go for it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, um, I feel also that this new topic, I mean, you, you said that COVID essentially forced you into this direction. In, in some ways, very organically, um, continues the, the kinds of ideas and, and thoughts that you've presented also in your earlier work, and and this fascination with uh, diversity, with migration, with the hetero heterogeneity of of Germany or Germans, is clearly something uh, that that is very uh, visible here as well. Um, yeah. So so what do I do? I uh, maybe. Mm, 
there was a lot of Guatemala, given the fact that you're actually talking about southern Germany. Um, so I'll start with a couple of comments on that, um, and then focus on the uh, on the Volksgeschichte. I was struck. I mean, I, I know you, and I know that this how should we call this rosy picture of Germans abroad or the anti anti post colonial crusade that you're on. Uh, that that also featured today, and in that sense, it's it's almost ironic that you ended with this particular picture because everything that people in these books say is you don't need a colonial state and you can still be an imperialist. And in some ways, I was wondering, isn't that true for the coffee folks in Guatemala as well? In, in, I mean, you you made them seem as if they were one of a kind, different from the British, the Dutch, the French colonialists, and so forth, but. If you think back, let's say to the you know the early days of the British in in India, someone like William Jones, right? He's an administrator, scholar. He's really a scholar. He doesn't. He, he's he's uh, more so than Zappa probably, and Dieseldorf and these folks. I mean, he's really changing uh, the the uh, intellectual landscape for 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 all of Europe. So. And, and and everything that Bernard Cohn says about William Jones and, and, and his the whole generation of, of administrator scholars in British India, you could probably also say about Germans in, in Guatemala. So it, does it really make sense to dis, dis, disentangle um, the economy so the economic interests, the, the the will to know and understand and some form of rule. I mean, you you did mention yourself that there are hierarchies in place, and the Guatemalan state is invested in them as well. Um, and even settler colonialism. I mean, the, the debate about settler colonialism has essentially bracketed the state to some extent, essentially arguing that you don't need the state for the settler colonialist drive to dispossess native societies. So therefore. It's, yeah, I think there's a bit of a, um, a artificial um, divide between this is what the colonial state does and this is what these people do. Um, but it feeds into and I think connects well with your overall agenda, which it seems to me has been for many years now to separate the people from the state, right? This is a, a lot of your work uh, circles around this question. And this brings us to the, the Volkskunde and the Landesgeschichte as well, um, because it's really focusing on the people um, and not the state. And I'm wondering here, to what extent, I mean, you, you now celebrated this as an, as a, at least that's how I perceived it, as an unthinking of Germanness, um, as, a, as a way of questioning the narratives of hegemonic of the nation state, obviously, but um, but also to to question the wholeness, the homogeneity, and so forth of the German nation. But it seems to me, and but you can tell us much more, that in many ways this this is these people are preoccupied, if not obsessed, with with Germanness uh, throughout. I'm I'm just wondering. So first of all. I, are they when they say we look at migration and the, and, and the you know the, the the difference that we see the, the 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 diversity that we see in these places do they look at immigrant communities i mean these are the 1970s and 80s this is when scholarship on on the turkish communities in germany began is is that what they are also concerned with my sense would be not that much um so, I mean, you, you also mentioned this long genealogy of German Volkskunde going back to real. What, what, what he's essentially interested in is, is to find the, you know, the, the German in these all kind, of, in these different sort of, yeah, groups, tribes, uh, regions, and so forth. What is it that unifies them? What makes them German? That's the preoccupation in all of this. So I'm wondering whether, for your project. Of undermining some kind of hegemonic Germanist, this is the, the, the go-to place. Um, yeah, it seems to me that in moments of radical change, this is true for real in the 19th century, and in some ways it's true for us in the present as well. There is this this attempt to go back to something that 
that we can hold on to. And even in this diversity, there is some there is some some Germanness. This is really what the many of the emigrants also did. As soon as they landed in Guatemala and Brazil and Argentina, they tried to hold on to something that they found was really German. And they noticed that they were not Spanish, they were not French, they were not native Indians and so forth, but in fact they constructed their Germanness. So I'm wondering whether that is an overarching uh, overarching concern here. Um, and then final question, what is the relationship to Alltagsgeschichte that actually takes off at exactly this moment? I'm not sure, I, I probably should know, um, but I'm sure you can say much more. I mean, this is when the Medics and the Lütkes and so forth um, pressed a particular form of history from below that was influenced by by similar trends in Italy, in Britain in particular, uh, even in India to some extent. Um, was there a conversation between them? Were there different politics? How do we historiographically place this conversation, even if it never took place? Is that all? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, I admit I was sort of baiting you with this last slide. Uh, you know, the thing is that what most interests me is, oh, sorry, Stefan, um, is why people do the things they do. And one of the things I want to do mostly when I look at historical actors is figure out what their motivations and intentions are for their actions. And the problem I've always had with these bigger arguments is that they tend to create monolithic answers to those questions. And so I, I wouldn't be the first to tell you that the Germans in Guatemala are part and parcel of internal colonialism and live in an imperialist world and are complicit in it. I, I think I said that. So I wouldn't divide it, but what I would say is that doesn't mean they're doing exactly the same thing as all the other Europeans and property owners in Guatemala. They're not. So the distinctions matter, and I want to know what those distinctions can tell us. And when I start to dig into them, I see them living in a world in Guatemala which is fundamentally different. Um, you had some examples from Britain, but I'll just stick with the Americans and the British who would go to Guatemala who have absolutely no intention of becoming Guatemalan, whereas the German Guatemalans do. And a lot of them are still there in 2000. But could this back be, afterwards. Yeah. am I allowed to? Yeah, yeah good could, could discussion. This, I mean, could this, be, could this be structural rather than, in other words, you know, this is a place where the Germans technically are then clearly not the political power in the region. So they're almost forced to go native, quote unquote. So while in, in other regions, it may be very different. So, well, I'd, wouldn't it be, could, wouldn't geopolitics rather than Germanists explain the difference? I don't think so because I see exactly the same thing in pretty much every Latin American state. German Chileans, German Argentinians, German Brazilians, um, people right, but this the natural is socialist Monroe doctrine. So, so it is. It is this whole area in, mm -hmm. is is clearly not Germans into Germany's hinterland. Right, that's true. That's true. But it's. I mean, is it Great Britain's hinterland? It's Great Britain's financial imperialism plus Uncle Sam, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Should I, I, <laughs> intervention. Um, uh, so what, Do you what, want to talk about Alters Geschichte? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I'll, yeah. I'll pick it up. We have dinner. It's going to be good. Um, <laughs> you can't come, but um, sorry for the Zoomers. This is the pay for not coming. Uh, uh, where was I? Uh, the uh, Imperialist Alters Geschichte. Um, oh, yeah. So the Alters Geschichte. You know, my I. My understanding, actually, the, the, the work that, I, uh, that I've read is that, yes, they move right. Um, the people who are working in, um, in Tübingen move quite quickly into looking at new migrants and new immigrants. It's not just between them. It is also Turks and others. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit. In fact, Baltinga, if I'm not wrong, actually joint publishes uh, one of his later books with uh, a Turkish-German woman whose name's now escaped me. It's quite interesting. So there's a pretty pretty easy slide into new kinds of migrants. It's no problem. As for the Alltagsgeschichte, um, you know, history, history from below, I think, and the conversation that's going on, it's, it is, I think, a revel, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question, but when I read the people who are doing it, when I read people like Baltinger, it seems to me, too, that he really feels that understanding what's going on in his world is not going to be explained by looking at the bigger structures. He has to see what people are doing within them. And so that's why he's doing dialect forschung because he wants to see how the language works 
When do people code switch? What happens? Why is it in Baden-Württemberg, for example, that the leaders of the industries also speak in dialect in moments, but not every moment? When are they engaging in that? What kind of affinities do those build? And you can't get that from structural analyses and political histories. And that also has an effect on why particular businesses succeed and others fail. Right? So there's an explanatory quality, and it goes back to my point of why people do what they do, but also why things change in the way they do. So I think that Altax Geschichte is part and parcel of an understanding of a, a different way to interpret transformations over time, um, one that can be more effective for answering particular kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually what excites me, because I think that I can use those same kinds of explanations as I follow migra German-speaking migrants abroad. And suddenly, when I want to understand why it is, just to give you an example, I was when I was first studying uh, German associations, associations in Argentina. I was talking to somebody who works on Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and she says to me, wait a minute, the Austrians are not going to the German clubs. And I said, yeah, and the German schools, and they're singing together. And she was blown away. I was like, no, that, that shouldn't be going on. I said, why not? And then we had a very long conversation. But this is actually the thing. Is the, if you study the southern German borderlands, it wouldn't surprise you at all. Because there's lots of associations that go back and forth, these um, these differences. Stefan? I'm just, so we have about half an hour mm -hmm. um, for discussion. And I'm sure, you know, others uh, want to raise some questions too. I, I, I suspect there will be about the politics of, of Volkskunde and, and globalizing Landesgeschichte. So they will follow also the Bastian's comments. So why don't we circle back to some yeah. of the comments later and take a few questions both uh, from Zoom, but also from the room. Uh, who wants to? We do, we do have one question on the uh, Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, this, uh, this person says, wonderful talk, Glenn, here is my question. In the 1990s, when I was researching in Saxony, my Mitsubishi system very passe. Uh, as Stagia has raised in words, Regionalgeschichte seemed to be as up to date and vibrant as life. Landesgeschichte had a leading advocate in Karl Heinz Laschke, Matthias Clausen, and Regionalgeschichte in the younger scholar Matthias Niederhausen. Did Landesgeschichte experience a revival while I wasn't looking, and so did historiography in the former East influence? So this must be Jim Retallick asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, come to dinner. We can work that one out. I, I, I don't. I know. I don't think so. And I think you're actually, you, you know, you're right. And I, I won't identify who said it to me last night, but someone did say that something along the lines of the people who are doing Landesgeschichte are also oftentimes the most boring people in the room. Um, but I, I think also to a certain degree that's kind of our prejudice, right? That we don't necessarily read this stuff and think about how it can inform what's going on. And I, um, you know, Caitlin Murdoch, who teaches at um, uh, Cal State Long Beach, turned me on to some really good Landesgeschichte that I'll send you away mm -hmm. from Saxony uh, that helped me better understand interactions of migrants across the border. Uh, but nobody reads it really because it's being published in pretty obscure places. Uh, so, you know, when I was actually had COVID and was isolated in tubing and I started reading this stuff and found that I learned quite a bit more from it. So maybe it will get sexier if I act as its advocate. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> it will. Philip, yeah. Thank you so much um, for this talk. I have a question on um, like the, the diversity in the regions, in like the South and Water region. We talk a lot about different dialects and, and different cultural forms, but you didn't speak about religion. That's what mm -hmm. To me, also the like the confessional divide, um, and I wanted to ask which which role religious and, and uh, confessional different place in like Guatemala, place like Guatemala, but also on the ground in the southern border region, um, and like, connected to this um, coming from German Jewish history, especially, um, I would say that Landesgeschichte in Jewish studies is extremely popular for the last three decades. Um, it refers to the, the, the Volkskunde, like the Jewish Volkskunde, uh, turned to the 20th century. A lot of research is done about um, uh, Landjugendtum, like rural Judaism. And, um, um, and I think even today, it's not possible to write 
looking into this rural regions up until the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Right. So, had you heard of Varga before? Uh, the name? Yeah. The, she, I mean, because she's a Jewish ethnologist as part of the Ethno yeah. Anal School, which is one of the really interesting things that she's doing this research in 1938. Right, and watching the transformation of the region as National Socialists become popular in this section of Austria. Um, uh, what's also really interesting is I, I don't know if you know about the work on, on actually Jewish Volkskundler who are actually collecting, creating museums of Trachten and things like that, and actually uh, you know, helping to codify it, right, and then being eliminated, and then other other people pick up their collections. Um, it's actually super fascinating, this uh, side of it. Um, in, in terms of the religion, yeah, the, the confessional divisions are fascinating. Even the Schwabenkinder, you know, they have to go to the right kinds of families, right? You don't mix Catholic and, and Lutheran families when you send the kids abroad. If you did, it's horrendous. Um, and these patterns travel with the migrants. I mean, I can show you families in Misiones in Upper Argentina where these are German-speaking Russians who lived in Russia, in the Volga region, in separate Catholic and Protestant villages, left at the same time, traveled together, went to Argentina together, settled next to each other, and set up separate schools and churches, hmm. right? Transforming the religious distinction. But what we could say is there's difference, but they're all moving together because there's also tolerance, right? Because they interact, they don't let their kids marry, but they don't, they could have lived apart. They didn't have to go to the same country. They certainly didn't have to live in the same region of Argentina, and they didn't have to live next door to each other, but they did. So this is something that I think in order to understand that action, you go back, right, and realize that, you know, like Luke and a lot of others have shown us, there's a lot more tolerance in um, religious history in the earlier period than we really recognized uh, when you go back and look at it from the perspective of the time. And and so that's what I see in, in, the, in the religiosity of the region, too, is that I mean, it still exists today when I, you know, ride a bicycle through um, southern Baden or in Württemberg and cross from, you know, a, a Protestant town into a Catholic parish. It's, it's obvious. You know it, right? But those places have been like that for an awfully long time. So there's a lot of distinction, but there's also a lot of tolerance and collaboration. And, and so you can emphasize one or the other, and you can see also that balance shift and change over time. And that becomes really interesting too, right? To sketch out when the balance is, when the tolerance ebbs, and when it flows. Um, and so that, I think, is also transferred to these new places. So again, one of my purposes of studying the region is then to understand the migrants who are sitting in places like southern Chile and Argentina who come from the same region and behave in surprisingly or not surprisingly similar ways. Which gets back to my point to Sebastian that understanding people's actions on the ground in particular historical situations is really what I'm after. And these bigger narratives, I think, are blunt instruments and ineffective tools. So I'm interested in the smaller narratives, like the Altax Kishita. I think it gives me more, more precise instruments. Thank you for your question. Oh, yeah, thank you um, for your stimulating talk. Um, I would like to pose a question about the specificity of the southern border region. Um, I work on the history of the Ruhrgebiet, and the Ruhrgebiet has also cultural diversity, migration, business networks. So this could be also a good case study for a globalizing land beneficial system, put it that, put it that way. Um, but I was thinking, what is the specificity of your, of your southern border region, either the other regions or, or, or Länder, also at least global or at least transnational level? So what makes um, your southern border region special or, or really or um, for me, it's the, the degree of mobility, not just within the region, which is pretty stunning over a longer period of time, but the way in which that informs people's mobilities outside of the region. I mean, it, it's if you read my last book, what you, you'd find is that inadvertently I found myself writing about people from this region all over the world. My intention was to write about German speakers from people for all over the world. And, and then suddenly I realized that so many of my examples are people coming from this region. It's not because I chose them, it's because they were all over the place, right? So I have, I have people in the Caucasus in Georgia, and then they're down in Argentina, and then they're up in Guatemala, and then they're in Chile, and I, I had to figure this out. People from the Ruhrgebiet, I didn't see in those locations. It doesn't mean they weren't there, but they just weren't as prominent um, and as active. Uh, however, I think your point about 
is would be my next step, right? Once I figure out one location, I start to think about others, and the Rurikabit would be a great place to go, right? Because in a lot of ways, to my mind, it's it's quite a bit different, and yet you just made a point that there are some striking similarities that I think would be great, really fruitful to explore. So thanks for the suggestion. Well, the difference is that people would migrate to the Rurikabit, right? Because mm -hmm. it was an industrial region. Um, okay. Um, do we have another Zoom question or um, no, uh, Friedemann? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm following up on, on the previous question, and I wonder whether, to some extent, perhaps you you tend to exceptionalize the, the, the notion of borderland. Because if you take a strictly Landesgeschichte perspective, then every region is a borderland because, in a way, the discipline of Landesgeschichte is obsessed with borders and and uh, demarcations, and um, so. As far as I can see, there is now a whole range of projects of globalizing the history of Saxony or volumes being edited on the global history of Westphalia and, uh, and you name it. So are you maybe making a case for, for a kind of globalizing Landesgeschichte at different degrees? So there might be a first degree of what these volumes on, on different regions do, and then you're adding a, a different layer or a different perspective um, with um, kind of regional history being entangled to a higher degree in some regions, and in your case, in those southern German regions or German-speaking regions, than for for other um, for other regions. And so, do we see a kind of double entanglement here, both on the broader regional level and on a on a global level? So, with southern Germans being more mobile, more diverse more open also at a global scale than maybe Germans from, from other regions. So would this be then a difference to what more perhaps traditional ways of globalizing Landesgeschichte um, would do? I mean, your last point is where I'm leaning. I'm not there yet because I haven't done the comparative work. Uh, some of your earlier examples tended, I think, to be, if I caught them all correctly, um, regional mm -hmm. states, right? And what interests me, and I actually think borderland is a terrible term. Um, it's really problematic to talk about the southern German borderlands because it could also be the northern Swiss borderlands. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just kind of silly. But what is important to me again is this: is this idea that the people who are living there from these three nation states or multiple states, however you want to parcel them out politically, there's incredible amounts of mobility all around the area, and this helps me understand why it is not at all surprising to see Swiss Austrians and people from southern Germany creating joint schools and associations in places like Guatemala or Chile. Right. Of course they would, because they already did. Um, so this is kind of a no-brainer. Whereas if you're just doing Saxony and talking about all the Saxons who went elsewhere and then sent back things back home, that's a different kind of mm -hmm. that's a different kind of project, and it's one that I appreciate but don't really want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, so I mean, I also really, you know, like the way you're going with this, um, but I'm not entirely sure where you are actually getting us. So. Um, is it and, and I see two possibilities, and for you they are connected, but I'm not quite sure um, if the connection actually works. So one would be, you know, to study to use this material that Volkskunde has assembled for a particular region, and essentially do what Lucy Varga did and look at a place and globalize that place through the ethnographic lens also of that material. So that would be fabulous and would bring you a lot of nice summers in <laughs> southern Germany. Um, so, so, that, so I envy you for, for, the, for the idea of a project like that. A different project, and this connects to what Sebastian said, would be to think about the kind of, so what is the work that ethnographic knowledge does, both in, the, in colonial spaces, but then also within the German lands? So I thought these examples that, I mean, I don't know if this exists, I'm not a historian of science, but the examples that you brought from the Volkerkunde Museum, um, I, I thought that was very striking that you have, you know, the eth so the ethnographic gaze that looks inward and the ethnographic gaze that looks outward. And I was wondering if it's the same kind of knowledge production or if there are differences and whether you would be actually the first who brings these two together um, and you would be better positioned than anyone I know to write actually a history of both and bringing these two together. So essentially, you know, 
the Humboldt Forum with displays on the Sorbians and the Swabs and you know all the different German tribes uh, and not just the Benin masks. So th that's what is you know somehow in what you presented. Well, you, I'm a little irritated that you just added my motivation to spend a lot of time in Southern Germany because <laughs> um, I'm afraid the funding bodies are going to realize that and uh, you're going to make my life more It's very obvious, Glenn. <laughs> I'm going to have to do something more sophisticated. The slide to buy food. Just take that out I, I, for the application. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm troubled with that part. But, um, I, I know, I, I, I mean, there are... I mean, it's a work in progress. I'm just starting, right? So you're right that there's multiple things going on, but I do see the interrelationship. Um, you know, the interesting point is that, you know, the ethnographic gaze inward and outward from the point of view of Berlin, uh, actually the real point is that Tyrol, the Tyrol is just as much outward as is um, uh, British Columbia. Um, that's why they send the same collector to both places. Um, and that I think is a, a pretty important point wow. to bear in mind. Um, and, but you're right. The, yeah, I guess that one of the reasons I put the example in the presentation is that I've been stunned by the really effective work that um, indigenous interlocutors have come to do with European and other ethnologists and also indigenous ethnologists as they dig into these old ethnological materials, which are basically historical texts that they can unveil to learn more about local histories. And I think that's pretty smart science that can also be applied to local places in Europe. Um, and that's something I want to do. And by doing that, I can better understand the people in those places and then better understand what they do when they go abroad. So I think that's why I put the particular example on this presentation. But you're right, I would like to actually do exactly what you're talking about at the end, um, which is open up this broader, what did you call it? You had a nice turn of phrase. But you've forgotten it too. Um, I don't know which one. <laughs> it is hard to choose. Um, but no, I, I, I mean, I'm keenly aware of the tension. Um, but I also think it's it's pretty productive, and I do actually agree that in one way, one of the great virtues of the project is just to stick with sort of an expanded Lucy Varga idea, as you said, and then just harness all this material that's gathered by these ethnologists from the region and rewrite an all toxic issue through the area. I think that would be fun to do, but I also think it would naturally set me up to do the second part, is then to use that knowledge that I gained through doing that, but then to trace people's actions in other places, um, which is something I really want to do as well. Hmm. Not just, I mean, is, is, is it the same people or is it the same strategy, right? I mean, other than so, so are there actually people who are interested in both the internal? So, so like the you know the William Booth kind of mm -hmm. darkest Africa, but in London, mm -hmm. right? This kind of thing. I mean, I, I don't know. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it could just be this the same kind of interest that leads different people to Guatemala and others to the local uh, neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But it might even be there might even be overlap. I don't know. I think there is overlap, and I think we always forget that before we have strong disciplinary borders, that there's a lot of discussion between the people working in these different areas at the same time, uh, which again is why Fiachal uses Bastian's collector, because he knows he's a great collector, because they're constantly in dialogue with each other. Um, it's only later that these fields can, right, and they start having these sort of collaborations, which is actually, I think, a shame, um, a big shame. And Um, if you look at the early uh, studies that use transatlantic record linkage, like uh, if you look at Walter Kampfner's study, he talks about uh, migration of Westphalians to Missouri. Mm -hmm. And then there's here on, in Berkeley, there was John, and I probably mispronounced his last name, Gierde, who wrote about the Ballestand region in Norway to Minnesota, to a county in Minnesota. So we find this emphasis on particular places. Of course, it doesn't mean that all immigrants in that particular, all arrivals are from a particular spot, but often that particular group has an outsized influence. I worked with an oil historian in southern Indiana, and there was this county, Du Bois County, which had three German dialects and 
the dominant one was a Catholic dialect. It was called Jasper ja, Deutsch. So it was Alemannish, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the history was quite interesting. A lot of people in that area were Catholic, but not from Baden, not from Switzerland, not from the Alsac area. They were Northern Germans, but they kind of assimilated into this group that um, spoke Jasper Deutsch, so they accepted it as a lingua franca, so they learned it. And it was used for decades and decades. And so, so if you look at urban areas, we can see the same thing. We can see Landsmannschaften, Selbsthilfegruppen, you know, like mutual rotating aid, uh, rotating credit societies, mutual aid societies. They are organized along Landsmannschaftliche line. So, you know, in Indianapolis, where I lived a long time, there was a list of groups that were dispossessed by the US government during World War One, and they all fought, fought this lawsuit to get some property in the city for a German park. They were successful. And so to look through the list of these petitioners, they're all regionally based groups, you know. So so I, I would kind of defend what Glenn said about the salience and the importance of those identities. I think we can sometimes overrate Germanness. It's the label that Americans put on these people. It's not necessarily the label that they use to self-identify. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I actually um, was at the University of Iowa. We did a big project on German Iowa and the global Midwest, and a lot of what you're saying is exactly right. Um, and of course, I know Kampoff knows work very well. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, right. This is not a new question, but I wonder if I might pose a question of my own. <laughs> I'm wondering to what extent does language play into the study you're looking at? Initially, one of the things you mentioned when you were first was looking at the opening point of, of this uh, research project you found yourself on, you find the group that you were looking at as German speakers in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Right. One of the things you mentioned when you're talking about the specificity of those people in Guatemala is their, you know, like. Uh, their uh, enthusiasm, I guess, for lack of a better word, to, to learn languages of Mayan people. And also, of course, if you look at the sort of southern border region, as you're calling it, there's a lot of dialectic diversity, a lot of um, language diversity as well. So I'm wondering if in your research and also in your thinking about the ways that these people are sort of engaging in these different regions and in sort of German global identity, I suppose that's something that is a, is a phrase you're open to. Um, is there a politics of multilingualism at all in there? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, yes, is the answer. Uh, I think you know the, the thing about the example from Guatemala and the linguistic um, flexibility of the people I'm studying, which I find so fascinating. I mean, there's over 28 Mayan languages. A lot of these people learn most of them. Um, or half of them, or a good percentage of them, I can guarantee you that the English speakers from North America and Great Britain don't. It's a big difference. And that's why the Germans are more successful. And it doesn't really matter where they're from. My assumption had been they were all from Hanseatic backgrounds. And they did this because it was a Hanseatic tradition to integrate family members into different localities where they may or may not take up citizenship, would have done other languages, intermarry, and things like that. And I thought, OK. So many people like Dieseldorf are coming from this area. This is what's going on. And then I realized that it's not just them. It's actually people from Stuttgart who also are coming with incredible linguistic talents that the English speakers from North America, Great Britain, or even the French, for that matter, just don't have. And when they are speaking another language, they're relying on Spanish, which none of the workers are actually speaking. Um, this is a huge dis difference. And it's not limited to Guatemala. It extends to all these other places. So it's really very important. And what I realized when I started to look at this region um, in the south is that when you look at Belsinka's works and the other works, you see these sometimes mutually unintelligible dialects being spoken by people who never get past primary school, but they're able to manage multiple languages simultaneously. These are the very laborers who then go abroad. It's much easier for them to pick up more languages than for someone who only speaks one. Um, so again, this is sort of an everyday experience, a piece of their everyday life that informs their actions when they go abroad and oftentimes their successes.
So that can happen at the level of the high class merchant all the way down to the laborer. And yeah, there's no question about that distinction. And so the German becomes an umbrella topic because underneath that, you not only have Alemannisch, you have Platt, you have all these other various languages. You know, the Mennonites are German speakers, but they're all speaking Platt. I don't understand it. Um, it's hard. Uh, and a lot of the Alemannisch probably don't speak it either. So yeah, thank you. Yes, one last question. Yeah. I have an idea question that I'm trying to cross across this. Uh, my sense from my own extended generational family background is that it was extreme poverty in the ever smaller uh, parcelization of some of the southern German, especially Württemberg, and uh, even some of Hessen, uh, that drove them out. And certainly that was true in the Odenwald, where, where uh, by the mid 19th century it was a horrible, horror. Uh, area. Uh, was this uh, equally true of the Junkers, uh, serfs, serfs, if I may put it, at least to the German side? I, I have the impression that there wasn't as much emigration from there, but I mean, I've looked at you know, statistics on this, but not enough to be sure. In the 19th century, I'm talking about, not after that. But it seems to me a lot of this was property destruction. Or, uh, you no longer had a you no longer had a livable uh, a property in much of the southern German extreme parcelization, and I've had some funny consequences of that because I've gotten checks for like the uh, Deutsche Mark equivalent of twelve dollars because some great 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 grandfather in the Flurbereinigung that was going on uh, finally you know when they try to get the land together you had to be a kind of viable piece of land. They bought. They, they 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 asked you to sign a waiver in case you had any still claim to it. And in this case, it was literally my great 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 grandfather, you know, whose uh, uh, brewer was being who's part of this. So about 180 of us got the Guarani gold at that level. But that made me think about the poverty issues mm -hmm. as yeah. an emigration thing as well. Yeah. So um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but. Uh, Heiko. Heiko was just talking about Walter Kampofna, mm -hmm. who has written a series of really great books that will give you the detailed information about which groups move when and why, um, and why northern Germans move in smaller numbers than southern Germans. And it's true there's poverty in the south, but a lot of a lot of people are coming out of Württemberg because they're pretty conservative pietists who don't like the way they're being treated, so they take off to either Russia or later to North or South America. Um, Mennonite groups are moving because they don't want to be in military service. Um, so there's, there's a, a variety of different things. And then, you know, people like uh, a lot of the coffee capitalists, they're not impoverished when they leave. They're just seeing opportunities. So all of those things are going on simultaneously. But there's no question that the, the more impoverished don't leave because they can't afford to go. This is another thing that happens. This is a real problem. And that's something that Kampoff now underscores very clearly, that when you look at the populate, uh, population um, that rolls into the American Midwest in the 1850s and 60s, it's overwhelmingly landed peasantry who have money. Um, and then they buy farms and do well. Um, he's got a whole, actually, um, there, I mean, there's also uh, travel guides of the time that tells you if you have this amount of money, go to this place. If you have that amount of money, go to that place. You'll succeed here. If you have a lot, go to Costa Rica because you're going to rock it. But if you don't, stay in Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question. All right. I I think, uh, Ray, if there's not another question from the Zoom. Um, thank you, Glenn. This was really wonderful. Yeah.